me uh, start the recording. And um, you guys are welcome to keep your video on. You're welcome also to turn it off. Um, Thank you. It's it's up to you guys. It's um, it's it's fine. It's you know it's oftentimes it just makes it um, a lot of people have technology issues where it bogs down their computer. So don't feel like you um, have to have your video on at all. Um, a lot of people also just are shy and don't want to be on video for whatever reasons. You can have your video off, and I'm fine with it. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen and get going with all of this. And make it official. All right, can we see my screen? Fantastic. Okay. Yes. Let me get the uh, chat up here for people who don't have microphones. All right, so anybody who doesn't have a working microphone, I've got the chat window open and I've gotten pretty good at being able to keep an eye on it while I'm talking. So by all means, um, interrupt me, right? This is a two-way street. This is not just um, a blathering on of a, a lecture. So if you've got questions or comments or anything, speak up or type up which you know whichever way you need to uh, get my uh, attention if you need me to say something again or you know whatever happens to be but first and foremost welcome everybody i'm glad you could be here um, for those of you that are watching this video just know that that is fine too um, i will record every single meet session that we will do and they will get added um, to the lovely set of meet sessions that we have that I'm sure some of you have already come across this uh, Google document and I will just keep adding links to these as we go. Um, so if you can't make uh, any session or uh, you know any particular session or any of the sessions at all, you know some people just have schedules that don't work, totally fine. Uh, just watch uh, the videos and I guess I should put this in an email because if uh, they're not going to watch any of the videos they're probably not going to watch this one but in case this is the only one you watch please 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 watch all of the sessions because um damn near every question you're going to have is going to get answered in these meet sessions right um not only do so this is how it's going to run mondays are going to be um lecture plus questions so the first 30 minutes of uh, of the meet session i will go through uh basically the powerpoint um presentation for that week's material and basically give you a little mini lecture on the theory of the stats that you're supposed to be learning this week because this course is really twofold you're supposed to learn a little statistics and then you're also supposed to learn a little technology now that technology used to be sas the school used to um, mandate that SAS was the only thing you guys used. It was SAS and only SAS. Uh, just recently, within the last year, they have softened on that policy and basically said, well, all right, we'll let you guys use any technology you want to. So you can use SAS, you can use R, you can use SPSS, heck, you can even use Excel or a TI graphing calculator or Vassar stats or StatCrunch or whatever technology you want to use, uh, they're fine with. The caveat being the school itself will still only support SAS as far as um, training goes, right? So like if you want help, they have SAS workshops set up. They don't have R workshops if you wanna do things in R. Um, you know, so if you want help from the school, you've gotta use SAS as far as you know technical help is. If you want help from me, I am an expert in Excel, so I can help you with anything you want to do in Excel. I'm pretty damn good in SAS, so I can help you with SAS. Um, I know enough about SPSS to help, although I'm, you know, I would say, oh, why bother? Don't, don't even do by SPSS. Um, if you want to do R, that's awesome, but I have not taken the time to learn R, so I really can't help you with it. Um, if you want to do a TI graphing calculator, I'm an expert in that. If you want to use StatCrunch, I'm an expert in that. If you want to use Vassar Stats, I'm an expert in that. Um, so basically, I can, help, I can help you with pretty much anything other than R. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, which technology should I use? My suggestion is this. Um, depending on the degree that you're doing, right? You're all in a doctoral program. So depending on the degree that you're doing, 
will dictate which of the ones you should do. If you are going to be doing some heavy lifting, statistically speaking, in your dissertation, or even in just future coursework that you have to take, you should really learn SAS or R. Either of those two are the gold standard when it comes to uh, graduate level work and something that you would publish in a dissertation. Um, now, if your dissertation topic is not really stats heavy, right? You're not gonna be doing a lot of statistical analysis in, in the field that you wanna study. Then it might not be worth your brain cells and frustration to try and learn SAS and R and things like that. You might wanna just get away with um, a graphing calculator in Excel. Good Excel skills are very marketable. So anything you can do in Excel to buffer your Excel skills is going to make you that much uh, more attractive to future employers. So just keep that in mind that anything you can do to get yourself kind of learning more Excel skills is always a good thing. But I would say in all honesty, SAS on demand is pretty damn easy. Um, everybody seems to, to fear it, but it's, it's actually pretty easy to learn. It's very, very powerful. And I would really recommend that all of you try as hard as you can to do everything in either SAS or Excel or a combination of the two. That's my recommendation. And of course, you can go any way you want, but that's why I'd recommend as far as the technology is concerned. Um, is this true for Math 810? Well, as far as the university policy is concerned, I believe it is campus wide. So um, yes, you should be able to use any technology you want in 810 as well. But again, the big huge caveat being that the school itself will only um, support SAS and they have told all of us instructors that we are only required to teach in SAS. So I am, well versed in other things and if you want to do something in excel and you want my help i'm more than happy to help you with that um, but if you move on to 810 you might have an instructor that insists on doing everything in sas and only in sas and then you're kind of sol right so that's another reason why i suggest you do sas as much as you can and as catherine has pointed out in the chat uh, window these sas workshops are awesome they are extremely helpful. Um, and, and as she said, they cal calmed her, her fears tremendously, right? Somebody who probably said, I, I know nothing about SAS and, and stats and then and took a workshop and, and did fairly, you know, everything seems a lot easier. So jump on those workshops as soon as you guys can and then ask questions, ask me, I will help, help, help. And, and by all means, watch my videos because I go through a crap ton of SAS in every class. So I'm always showing you guys how to do stuff in SAS um, in all of these older videos, whether it's, um, you know, the, the ones from just last term or the term before and so on and so forth. So always go back through those um, for extra help on, on how to, and you'll see kind of the same <laughs> things done over and over again, right? I always get the same questions over and over again on SAS and I'm more than happy to do it. So that would be, um, um, my recommendation is to to do SAS. It, it really, trust me, as I said on the first slide, right? It's really easier than you think it is. Not only is this class easier than you think it is, stats is easier than you think it is, and SAS is easier than you think it is. Okay, um, any other questions on the technology kind of stuff? All right, fantastic. So let's go through the quote unquote lecture part of today. What are we supposed to cover today? Well, we're gonna go over our class assignments because I know there's some confusion on that, especially how I've kind of changed things up from the, the general template that the school uses. So there might be some conflicting information out there and I wanna clarify any of that. We've talked briefly about SAS. We're gonna get more into that. I'll talk about our expectations and then we'll get into the actual SAS stuff. So, um, as far as assignments, I tried to make this as clear as possible in, 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 uh, in the announcements and stuff, but I know there's some muddying of the waters because I have changed things up. This course normally um, makes your homework worth 110 points each. 
and then I think the mini project was still 150. The critique was only worth 65 points. I think the final project was worth like 265 or something. And then they gave you 50 points for this first SAS meeting. And you earn the 50 points by um, uploading screenshots of showing that you had in, in, um, enrolled in SAS On Demand and you had uploaded some data to SAS On Demand. And, and that assignment still exists in, in the standard course shell. Like if you guys have never taught in Canvas before, those of you who are going into education might want to perk up for this. And those of you that aren't can just, you know, go get a cup, cup of coffee. But um, <clears throat> if you're working in Canvas, often wherever you're working, the school will create a shell for you, especially if you're an adjunct. Um, and everything is kind of pre-made and then you can put your own stink on it. You can just kind of edit it a little bit and different schools will let you edit it at different levels. Um, Franklin is kind of um, pretty cool. They, they let me mess around with this a lot. Other schools, this is locked down, man, and you can't change much of anything. You, you're basically just coloring by numbers. But that being said, the, the course shell that they send out still has that stupid assignment where they want you to um, upload pictures of SAS. And I'm like, well, how can you change the policy where you no longer force students to use SAS and then have an assignment that forces them to use SAS, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I got rid of that. Um, and then I also thought it was really stupid that a homework assignment was worth 110 points. I'm like, come on, for the love of God, just make it 100 points, right? So I shuffled some things around. I made it more um, what I thought was kind of uh, weighted more appropriately where your your mini project was worth, um, I think about the same, but your critique, which you know was a fair amount of work, I gave it some more points and took a little bit off the final project. And then I also took away the presentation aspect of it. So the biggest changes that I've done to this course where you might see some, um, pre-made materials you know if you're if you're really reading all the stuff in the course i tried to edit out everything that was um different from what i'm doing it but you might still come across something that i missed if anywhere in the course it talks about groups and being assigned to a group and in a group and evaluating your group like for instance i know the rubrics which i i've said numerous times ignore but in in the rubrics um, even for the assignments, I think there's a portion in here where it says, yeah, completion of peer evaluation rubric. We don't do that because you're not in groups, so you're not evaluating your peers. So if you're really paying attention, and I can't edit this for some strange reason, I can't edit the rubrics. <laughs> there's just certain things I can't edit. Um, but anywhere that the course talks about groups and being in groups, just ignore. Um, again, the, the class is originally designed that I am supposed to assign you all to groups and you're supposed to work with your group on the homework and then turn in individual homework sets, right? Like, so you work together as a group, but you don't copy each other um, and you all turn in individual homeworks. And, and that's, that's great. I absolutely 100% encourage you guys to work in groups. And in fact, um, some of you have already taken the initiative to, um, you know, start groups up here in the dialogue. I, I think Bruce was one of the um, the original founders of this group idea. And a lot of you have been clamoring that you uh, agree with it. And it seems, sounds like a lot of you are planning on working in groups, which is awesome. And I 100% encourage that. I 100% say it's totally fine for you guys to help each other with these homework questions. Um, you do not want to share your work. You don't want to you know, here, let me show you how I did number one. I'm just going to send you my file. No, it's, we can get on a Zoom call and I can walk you through it. I can show you how to, I being another student, right? You can walk them through it. You can show them how to do it in SAS. You can discuss things, but you don't want to share work. We actually had um, just last term, one student who was helping another student by um, giving her basically his homework and saying, you know, this is how I did it. And then she just turned around and uh, submitted it as her work, you know, and so they both got dinged for plagiarism. So you don't want to be sharing your work that way. It's just, it's not, it's not good. It's not safe. Um, and it's, it's not what intended, right? The idea of working in groups 
is to help each other. Oh God, I'm really struggling with number three. Any suggestions? Oh yeah, well I, you know, I I tried looking at it this way, blah blah, blah you know, those kind of things. And then of course I'm here to help as well. Um, so group work is fine, but I I don't put you in um, official groups. So anything that talks about grouping, just ignore. Uh, anything that talks about presenting the final, ignore. I'm not going to do presentations for the same reason that I'm not doing groups. And that is you guys are busy and you guys have schedules that don't match. So it seems kind of asinine to try and force you into groups when your schedules might not overlap. And it's pretty darn impossible to get you all together at the same time to do presentations. So it's just not worth it because um, it doesn't help the learning. For you guys to present your final projects, nobody's going to learn anything from that. They, they really aren't. It's just, it's not pedagogically sound. So I took that apart away. And those are kind of the biggest changes. Everything else is going to be fairly similar to the original um, flavor of the class. So there shouldn't be any other confusions, hopefully, on any of that. Um, so any questions on um, the assignments, how much they're worth, and when they're due? Okay, awesome. This is all, you know, in the announcements and stuff. So um, don't feel like you have to write this all down. Do Dr. McBride? Um, yes, Emily, Emily, go ahead. Um, th thanks for that overview. Just a couple questions. Um, so is Turnitin automatically attached to the submission button for grading? I think it's um, automatically, uh, I think there's an actual spot for it for just the critique maybe, or it might, there might be a turn it in for everything. I'm not sure. Uh, let me see if I go to student view and assignments, I thought there was a separate. So if you go to the critique, hmm. Yeah, I think I, I'm looking at uh, Mary, and I agree. I, I think I think it's it just goes just automatically in, attached. Yeah, I think it does. I think it just automatically goes there. I know when I when I go to grade it, it gives me a turn it in score, and it tells me um, the only um, the only assignment that I'm really going to even pay attention to turn it in at all is going to be your critique, because your critique should be um, ex uh, completely 100% original because you're, you're finding your own, uh, some article that, that matters to you and you're critiquing that article and you know nobody else in the class is gonna pick the same article. Okay, so that makes sense um, because my next question was going to be, you know, if we build off of your questions that you've posted in Google Docs, which thank you for that, that's very, very helpful, all those uh, weeks of questions. Yes. So we don't have to type them out on our exactly. own. Exactly, that's why um, I did it, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was just thinking, well, that's gonna affect our similarity report for Turnitin. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. That, so. Yeah, which is why I don't pay attention to Turnitin for any of your homeworks, because if you are using the homework questions, then of course your similarity scores are gonna be off the chart. Um, yeah. The same also goes for the mini project and the final project because you're all going to be using the same set of data with the same set of questions. So again, if you put those questions into your um, mini project and or final, that's also going to inflate your similarity scores. So um, I leave it up to you as to whether or not you want to include the questions with any of your assignments. I strongly encourage you to um, include the questions with all of your assignments only because when you go back and look at this stuff, you know, when you go to take 810, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to remind yourself of what you were doing and kind of relearn the material if you have the question right there with the answer rather than a word document full of answers and you're like what the hell do these have to do with you know where did they come from and so that's that's why i don't worry about turning in for anything okay that makes a lot of sense and, and my last question would be are we sometimes going to be turning in a word document at the same time as an excel spreadsheet for the same assignment great question no um everything should just be finalized into a Word document. So you will be doing some work in Excel. Usually the only work you're gonna be doing in Excel is either cleaning up your data so that you can submit it to SAS and get it to work. Or if you're actually doing some analysis in Excel because you wanna do it in Excel or create a graph or something like that, um, rather than in SAS, you're still gonna to want to copy and paste that into the Word document if you made a graph or if you, you know, made a table or something like that. I never need to see the raw data, so you don't need to you know, um, attach an Excel spreadsheet for that. All of the assignments that you're going to do, you, everything I need to see can be in a Word document. 
and, okay, and, great. and must be in a Word document. So there, don't feel like you need to submit anything other than that one Word document with your finished product. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. Yep. And, and as I mentioned, I think in the email, make sure that you're just showing your work. So in that Word document, you know, either get very good at using um, the math generator tool. So you can, if you need to put in uh, equations and things like that, show your work that way. Or, you know, if you want to do it longhand, then, you know, do it on a piece of paper and scan it in or take a picture with your phone and crop it and, you know, put your work in that way. But most of the work that you're going to have to do by hand or, you know, quote unquote, show your work is going to be pretty um, basic mathematical things because most of the work, you know, the vast majority of the work is going to be done by SAS. So it's going to do all the heavy lifting for you. And then when it comes to that, all you have to do is copy your results and, and paste those. And in some equation, some, sorry, occasions, copy your code and paste your code in as well. Always as pictures, by the way. So if you're, um, if you're going to copy your code uh, and paste your code uh, or your results from SAS into a Word document, uh, please hear me now always copy and paste everything as pictures because there are certain things that are going to come out of SAS that you could actually kind of like highlight and copy and it will copy it as text. And then when you paste it into your Word document, it gets all screwed up because the margins are different and, and nothing looks right. And, and the specific example, which you'll never remember until we get to it later, is when we're doing stem plots, stem and leaf plots. There's a way to make a stem plot in SAS if you copy it and paste it as text, it gets all screwed up and it no longer looks like a proper stem plot. So you have to do a screen grab, right? You either have to use the snipping tool, the lovely little snipping tool right here if you're on a, on a Windows machine, or there's a similar thing in SAS, or I mean, sorry, in on a Mac where you, know, you highlight a certain portion and bink, and it takes a little picture of just that portion and then you can paste it into your Word document that way. And that's what you're gonna wanna always do with SAS. Okay, anything else? Okay, let's move on. I've talked about doing SAS and, and trying to do everything in SAS. And like I said, I can help you with other tech, but please try your hardest to use SAS. It's the best, it's going to be the best for all of you, no matter what your degree uh, choice is. What I expect of you guys, get your assignments in on time and in the proper formats to regularly communicate with me if there are problems or especially questions, right? And to ask those questions, darn it, I'm here to help. So don't let problems fester. Ask often and ask early. That's what I'm here for. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to wait till a Monday or a Thursday, because those are usually the days that we're going to have meet sessions and I'm still waiting for more of you to do the polls, but it's looking like Thursday is going to be the winner over Wednesday. And that's, in my opinion, the better day anyways, because it gives you extra time to get everything done. Because Mondays is, you know, the, the lecture plus questions day where I spend, you know, like I said, the first half hour kind of going through the theory and the slides and stuff like that. But Thursday, the second meet session, whether it's Wednesdays or Thursdays, is 100% nothing but Q&A. Right. I've I've gone through all the material. There's no point in me lecturing anymore. Of course, if you have questions, I will, of course, go over the material again, but it's not going to be a formal lecture setting. It's going to be a QA. and a I still don't understand blank. OK, then I explain a little bit further or I don't know how to do question three in the homework. And then we go through question three in the homework. Right. And that's so it's better, in my opinion, that that happens on a Thursday because it gives you guys that extra day to do the work because you need to do all the homework and then ask the questions on Thursday, get those questions fixed that you were having troubles with. And then it gives you time to turn in your finished product. Those are my expectations. Of course, the things I'm going to do, check email daily, please. I checked email like hourly, really. Um, grade within five days of due date that these are just the expectations put on me by the university. I normally grade things, um, sooner because I grade usually every Monday, Tuesday at the latest, and everything is due Sunday. So it's usually graded within a day or two. Um, I will obviously provide feedback. And like I said, if you're going to submit things early, it's got to be in a Word document so I can use track changes. Um, once you submit things uh, formally, 
in um, what's called a speed grader, the, the feedback is, is embedded within the document there. So if you just go into your grade and your, into your grade book and click on the assignment, it'll pop up and you'll see the feedback that way. And then of course, my biggest job is to answer questions. So please, 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 please ask them. Okay, questions on any of that stuff before we jump into the actual um, statistics of today. Okay, so let's talk about what we're supposed to learn statistically speaking today. Uh, the first thing is uh, some definitions, right? We need to understand what the heck these words mean so that we can all uh, speak the same language. In statistics, um, there are, are basically two forms of statistics. There are experimental statistics and then there are theoretical statistics. And um, we're working mostly in the theoretical in this course in the fact that you know, we're using formulas and things to predict what could happen in the future. Experimental statistics is where you actually just run an experiment and see what the numbers give you. And then within statistics, there are things that happen in the population versus things that happen in a sample, right? And so the population is just the entire set of things that you're interested in studying. And then a sample is just a subset of those things because it's usually um, impossible to get data, right? Get any kind of measurements from an entire population, um, unless you're trying to study something pretty small, right? So for instance, if you're interested in how adolescents learn, well, you can't test all adolescents. Even if you're only concerned with, you know, just how adolescents learn in the state of Kentucky, you still couldn't get data for all adolescents in the state of Kentucky. That's just impossible. Um, so no matter what your population is, it's usually impossible to get measurements on the entire population. So instead you get a subset of those students and you measure that subset and you use that to extrapolate, you know, best guess what's happening in the population. And then of course, any measurements that you do on a sample is called a statistic and any measurement that you do on a population is called a parameter. So it's kind of nice. Population with a P has a parameter with a P. A sample with an S has a statistic with an S. So that helps you remember which is which. Um, now we don't have any tests in this class. You don't have to worry about memorizing this stuff. Um, but when you see these words, that's what they're gonna mean. And remember when I talk about measurements, that's a, a general term for any data collection, right? If you're asking students their names, technically that's not a measurement, but that's what I mean when I talk about measurements. It's, it's any data that's collected on stuff, right? So when they talk about the set of all measurements of interest for a population, just realize that a measurement is not, it's a bad word. They shouldn't be using measurements and I really shouldn't either. It should be a set of all data of interest, right? Or characteristics of interest because you could be interested in, in, a, in a subject's height, but you could be interested in a subject's ethnicity and an ethnicity can't be measured, right? Um, so they're not technically measurements all the time. So just keep that in mind that sometimes these, um, the verbiage can be a little um, misleading. Okay, an experimental unit, that's the basic object on which measurements, right? Characteristics, data, right, is taken from. So usually our experimental unit is a person you know, in, in most statistics, we're interested in what happens with human beings. So our, our statistical unit is usually each individual person. So if we were talking about adolescence again, it'd be each one of those individual kids would be our, our experimental units. And those uh, measurements, things that we, we take from them can be composed of what are called measurement units and measurement units are exactly what they should sound like. They're units of measure. So a measurement unit is, is, is uh, specifically things like feet, inches, meters, gallons, liters, pounds, kilograms. Those are measurement units. So they're just units of measure. Factors are the variables in your experiment that are set by you, the investigator. So those are the things that you can control. So in an experiment, the factors are the things that the scientist in control can, um, can, can, can uh, manipulate. So for instance, whether or not a group gets a drug versus a placebo, that's something that the researcher can, can control and that becomes a factor. 
the response is the variable that um, is not controlled. And it's usually the thing that you're trying to see what happens when you mess around with the factors. We normally talk about a response and control and treatment. These words are usually only used in um, the sense of doing a true experiment. So if you're actually in a lab working with mice, right? Or you're in a lab, you know, testing a drug on humans or whatever it is, when you have an actual experiment where you have a control group and you have a treatment group and those types of, um, you know, strict conditions, that's when we normally use these words of uh, a control and a response and a treatment and things like that. When you're out in the world and you're, <coughs> bless you, and you have, um, and you're not doing a, uh, an experiment, you have what's called an observational study. So like you want to figure out what things um, can help lessen aggression or aggressive behavior in adolescence. Well, that would be an observational study because you would go out and you would gather data on a bunch of um, adolescents and, and figure out which factors, right, the data that you're gathering seem to correlate to more aggressive behavior or less aggressive behavior. You wouldn't be able to actually get a bunch of, you know, teens together and, and half of them do something to them to try and make them more aggressive and the other half not to, right? It'd be, it'd be unethical to do this kind of thing. So those are going to be observational studies. So we don't normally talk about those things as being um, response or we don't talk about them being independent and dependent variables. We talk about them being this more vague stuff. So just sometimes the terminology can flip flop depending on what you're doing. I'm not, I don't care. I'm not a big um, vocabulary Nazi. Just know that when these words crop up, this is what you know our textbook thinks they mean and i think you guys have all heard these things before so you're vaguely familiar with what you know the control group is and what the treatment group is and you know you've got the response variable and those kinds of things um you might you might have also heard them as being the independent and dependent variable right the independent is kind of like the factor the thing that you can mess with you can augment and then the dependent variable is going to be that response that happens so here's a simple example, right? You've got three different fertilizers to try. One of them is currently in use. You're going to choose 10 fields. You're going to divide each of those fields into three sections, and you're going to put one fertilizer, right, in each of those three sections. So the population of interest is going to be well, all corn fields. I guess these are corn fields, right? Well, they didn't say that. They should be more specific. The sample is going to be the 10 fields that you're dealing with. The experimental unit right, is going to be each of those sections of the field because you divided each field into three sections and then you used um, a different fertilizer in each section. So each one of those sections is going to be considered your one little experimental unit and you're going to gather data from each of those sections, right? The factors, the things that you can control, in this case, is there's only one and that's the type of fertilizer that you use in each of the sections because you obviously can't control uh, you know, how much rain and how much sun and all that kind of stuff. The treatments, well, which fertilizer is used on each part of each field is considered the treatments, right? So you're going to have fertilizer A, B, and C, you know, kind of thing. So those are going to be your three different treatments. The control might be the fertilizer that's currently in use. We don't know. They haven't really told us which of the three that is. Because the idea is you're going to look at the response and the response is going to be how well the corn grows and however you want to measure that. Are you going to measure it by height? You're going to measure it by yield, right? So like after that section is harvested, um, then, you know, how is the yield measured? Is it measured by volume or is it measured by weight? You know, that kind of thing. So however you want to measure it, that ends up becoming your response. Because always think about these things, always try and think about statistics as it applies to the real world. Don't think about it in the abstract, right? When you start looking at these words, they don't make sense until you start thinking about, well, why the hell would we do this in the real world, right? Why would we go through the hassle of picking 10 fields and dividing them into three sections and trying three different fertilizers? And I'm, and I'm actually asking, you guys tell me, why do you think we would try this? figure out which one increases yield if, exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly so when you think about it that way and you think about it in the logical sense of why the hell we would even do this it helps 
all of these words make more sense, right? Okay, well, yeah, we want to see which one works better. So then that makes sense why the factor, the thing that we would change would be the type of fertilizer because we want to see does this fertilizer work better than this fertilizer or that fertilizer and so on and so forth. And that's, guys, that's really probably the number one use of statistics is um, the world in the past has worked a certain way and we want to see if we can change it. And so we try something new and we measure the effects and statistics tells us whether or not it was a success. Did it change it or did it not change it? And that's basically what statistics does for the most part. Okay, confounding variables. These are very common in most experiments. And these are things that can affect your outcome, right? They can mess with your response. They can have an effect on the response you're trying to measure. So in this case, they can have an effect on how well the corn grows, but they aren't technically part of your experiment. They're something that you don't have control over or they were something that you weren't aware of, you know, that was kind of underlying the surface that, that you didn't think about. You didn't quote unquote control for it. You've heard about studies where they try and control for certain things. Well, you normally try and control for confounding variables, things that are going to influence the outcome that you don't want to allow it to influence the outcome. Like for instance, if there were insects in a certain field, right? That would definitely screw with the yield and it would tarnish your results because it would make one fertilizer look weaker than it actually was because the insects were keeping the corn for growing as good as it was. Also just the different types of soil that you planted in, right? Anybody who knows anything about gardening knows that soil is important, right? Certain things need sandy soil, certain things need more loam, certain things need wet soil, you know, all that kind of stuff. So these fields, these 10 different fields could be in 10 different areas with vastly different soils. And then there's all sorts of other things that, you know, we don't have um, control over. Even if the 10 fields are in the, you know, in the same state, one field might get a lot more rain than another. And we all know that water has a huge effect on whether or not things grow, right? So there are all these confounding variables, things that you don't have control over that can mess with your results. So that you, you know, as a good statistician, you have to keep an eye on that and, and, and try to account for it as best as you can and try to eliminate them from um, the, uh, the measurements, you know, the experiment in general as much as you can. Okay, questions on that example or the definitions in general? All right, um, next, the type of uh, sampling design is very important. So whenever you're going to do um, more of an observational study, as I mentioned, rather than a, an actual experiment where you're going to gather some data um, a certain way, that often um, uses sampling, right? A lot of, we've been, oh, especially in, in election cycles, we hear all these things about polls and polling. Those are just, you know, samples. Those are, those are just ways of, um, getting people's thoughts and opinions from surveys, right? And surveys are horrible. As we've seen time and time again, the poll numbers um, don't match the actual voter outcome. <clears throat> Often, that happens all the time. And that's, there are, there are various reasons for that. But what it highlights and what I want you guys to always know, right? Because more than anything, if when you leave this class, I want you to be a better consumer of statistical information, you should know that any data that comes from a survey is 100% crap. Absolute, unfiltered, unhomogenized BS. Surveys are terrible. Now, unfortunately, surveys are sometimes the only way we can get the data that we want to get. But what you need to know is that every survey, no matter how well it is designed and no matter how well it is applied, will always have an inherent bias to it. And it's called the volunteer response bias. They've, they've, they've studied this ad nauseum for decades, and they have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that the people who are willing 
to respond to a survey, i.e. the voluntary response, are statistically significantly different than the general population. So what that means is if you give a survey and you get responses to that survey, that sample that you just got is not going to be perfectly representative of the population in general that you're trying to glean this information about because the type of people who refuse to take a survey are very different than the type of people who will take a survey. And so you're only getting that you know, one side of the argument viewpoint. If you think about it, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a plain, you know, easy to understand um, way, think of it this way, that only women would say yes to taking a survey and men would always say no. Now that's not the case, but if that was the case, don't you think those results would be horribly skewed? Because you'd be missing out on one complete gender, right? Well, it's not that cut and dry, obviously, but it is like two different camps. There's the camps of people who will say, yeah, I'll take a survey. And then there's the camp of people who say, uh, don't bother me, I don't wanna take a survey. And the problem is, is um, you know, not everybody is even that um, biopic, you know. There are times when I will gladly take a survey and there are other times where I will say, I don't have the time, go away, right? So it, 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 people can go in and out of each group, but the bottom line is you always have a volunteer response bias. So just keep that in mind. Other types of samples that you can do, right? You've got the random sample, the cluster sample, the systematic stratified convenience. These are all just different ways of sampling people. Obviously the only truly uh, good way of getting data is what's called the simple random sample. That is the gold standard. And that is the idea that you put everybody's name in a hat and you just pull the names out of a hat. That is technically what a simple random sample is. Obviously that's not what you're doing, but conceptually if you want to if you want to visualize what a simple random sample is it's whatever your population is that you want to look at you need to think about taking that entire population and dumping that entire population into a barrel and you're going to one by one pull things out of that barrel until you have the sample size that you want and that is a simple random sample anything that deviates from that idea is not as good and there will be certain biases that will come along with that sample. So again, as a good consumer of statistics, anytime anybody presents you with statistical results, if they do not tell you specifically how they got those results, if they do not divulge the exact procedure in which they sampled their data, you should suspect the results immediately because a good statistician will always tell you exactly how they got their results. Because if they don't divulge how they got their results, one of two things has happened. Either A, they're not telling you for a specific reason because they're trying to mislead you with their results and they cherry pick the results by sampling them in a certain way. I.e., they put a, you know, CNN wants you to think their policies are, you know, the policies that America wants, so they, poll their viewers. Fox News wants you to think that their views are the views of the world, so they poll their viewers. Well, those are both very polarized viewing sets, right? So if they don't tell you that the data came from just their viewers, then, then they're trying to hide the fact that they came from just their viewers, and there, ergo their results are going to be very polarized. So if they don't tell you how they sampled, they're either trying to mislead you or they're, they don't know enough about statistics you know, they're just stupid. And in either case, you really shouldn't listen to those results. So keep that in mind. They should always tell you how they sampled. And the best way to sample is a simple random sample. Anything else, you got to start taking the results with, you know, larger and larger grains of, of salt. Is that the, take it with a grain of salt? Yeah, that's the phrase. Um, the other thing is the difference between clustered and stratified makes students heads explode. Um, so this is what I always do and show a pretty little picture. And this is one of my favorites because I think this really highlights the difference between the two really well. There's a couple different ones, this one and then this one. Oh, this is my favorite one. So stratified versus um, cluster sampling. 
in both types of sampling, you're going to take your population and you're going to group them, right? You're going to put them into separate groups. Now, when you do stratified sampling, which is the one on the left, you'll notice that our six groups are all homogenous in colors, right? This is the group of all black things, the group of all blue things, right? All purple, all red, all brownish, yellow, or whatever that is, gold color, and then all green, right? So in, in stratified sampling, you, you stratify. When you put things in strata, that means that they are grouped by characteristics. So you put them in these six categories based on a characteristic that you're actually um, concerned with. You know, so like you, um, maybe you wanna figure out how uh, different voters feel about a certain initiative. Well, this group would be Democrats, Republicans, Independents, the Green Party, you know, unaffiliated, whatever it is, these are your six groups type of thing. And then what you do, once you put your population in their strata, in their groups, their homogenous groups, <clears throat> you then randomly sample from amongst all groups. And you'll notice that samples don't have to be the same size, right? They took two from here, three from there, two from there, and so on and so forth. You try to keep your samples the same size unless in the population, um, certain stratas are uh, weighted more than others. So let's say these six strata were um, ethnicities. And in the population that you were looking at, maybe it's like 30% Caucasian, 20% uh, African American, 15% uh, uh, Hispanic, you know, and then it's only like 5% Asian Pacific Islander, right? And you've got, so you've got all these varying percentages of ethnicities. Well, it wouldn't make sense to take an equal um, number of things, right, an equal number of people from each of the groups, you would probably want to take a weighted sample, right? So um, if you wanted a sample of 100 people and 30% of your population was Caucasian, it would make sense to randomly choose 30 Caucasians to make up 30% of your sample, right? And if you're, like I said, if your population was 20% African-American, then it would make sense to randomly choose 20 people from the African-American sample because you would want your sample to be more representative of the population. You wouldn't want an equal number of every ethnicity because there's not an equal number of ethnicities in the population. So just keep that in mind that you don't have to have um, an equal sample size. And oftentimes it's not desired to have that. So that's stratified. Cluster sampling, you still put your population in groups, but now the groups are heterogeneous, right? They're not homogeneous. They're not all the same. You can see you have all the colors in each group. And so what this is is Again, the different colors represent some sort of characteristic that you're testing on. And you wanna see if the green group responds differently than the pink group, you know, that kind of thing. Well, rather than segregating the green group and the pink group and then choosing, you know, from each of those groups, which is what you do in stratified, you take your entire population and you break them up by some other characteristic other than what you're looking at. So you can see they're not broken up by color. You can think of them as being broken up geographically, right? Maybe this is the Northwest, the North, the Northeast, and so on and so forth, right? So you, you take a population, you break them up by some other aspect, some other characteristic, and then you randomly choose a subset of those clusters. So this is these are each called clusters. So you would have six clusters, just like you would have six strata. And then you would randomly choose a number of clusters. In this case, we chose two clusters. And then what you do is you sample that entire cluster. So you take every everything from the Northwest and then everything from the South. And that becomes your sample. And, you know, each technique has its disadvantages and advantages. There are certain times where one would be better than the other. Bottom line is for most um, statistical analyses, it's just better to always do a simple random sample. And like I said, that's the idea of a name and a hat. It just means that everybody has the same equal opportunity of being sampled. Um, samples should be representative of the population. That's where I was talking about where, again, if you had 30% of a certain ethnicity, it would make sense that your sample would be 30% that ethnicity. If ethnicity was an important factor, right? If it had some sort of bearing on what you were measuring. If it wasn't, then you wouldn't care about that. Maybe gender 
has a bearing on what you're looking at, then you'd want to make sure that the distribution of your gender variable would be the same, right? So if the population you were looking at was 70% female and 30% male, then you'd want to make sure that your sample was 70% female and 30% male. So when we talk about representative, just realize that it only needs to be representative on the variables that matter to your study, right? The things that you think have an influence on what you're looking at. And then things to always look for, like I said, the self-selection, that's that um, voluntary response bias, and then confounding variables. Okay, questions on any of that? Because that's basically it, guys. That's, that's all the theory for this week. Um, we're just looking at um, sampling techniques and different types of data um, as far as that's concerned. And then in week one, most of the stuff you're doing is vocabulary stuff and then getting set up on SAS. So any questions on any of that kind of stuff? All right, yeah, pretty basic stuff. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about in the last nine minutes is SAS on demand. If you haven't already, um, after these classes, do we have to pay? No, that's a great question. SAS on demand is, is as far as I know, free forever. Um, I've been using this forever and they've never asked for a dime from me. Um, I think as long as you have an academic um, email address, then it's free. So it's supposedly supposed to be free for all uh, students and teachers. So when you sign up for this, I think you have to use a .edu address. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I think, um, no, you do not need to sign up for SAS workshops. I just highly recommend that you do so. They're very helpful. But no, absolutely not. You do not have to. Um, and I think I remember a student saying they signed up with their regular email and it still worked. So I could be wrong on that whole EDU thing. But whatever it is, go and sign up for it. It's pretty easy. It's all laid out. Um, you know, in this, if you go to the SAS folder, the SAS stuff, and um, you look at this accessing accessing SAS thing. It walks you through all the steps of, of how to uh, create an account and then um, log in. Now, some things that I will point out, and I thought I wrote it in here. Yes, be sure to check your spam folders. So once you go through this, um, you know, and, and kind of do your create profile after, you know, a couple minutes or so, it's supposed to send you an email that then allows you to log in, those will oftentimes go to your spam folder. So if you haven't seen anything after like an hour, check your spam folders. Um, yes, workshops are offered through the library. They're, they're through our you know, learning commons basically. So if you just follow the steps in this um, Google doc, it will walk you through how to create an account and get into SAS. And it's pretty darn easy. Once you get it, you know, you just every time you log in, you have to click here saying that you're accepting the terms and then you sign in. And SAS will work on any computer with Internet access. Doesn't matter if it's a Mac or a PC because it's just web based, right? It's it's browser based. So as long as you've got access to the Internet, you can use SAS on demand. So you don't have to worry about what kind of computer you have. You'll want to click here for SAS Studio and it'll open up your SAS Studio. The nice thing about SAS Studio is it always um, retains whatever you were working on last. So if you have some data files open, and even if you have some programs open, like you were running some summary statistics or something, when you log back into SAS, it will be there again. As you can see, I still have this tab from the last time I taught this course, in my last session, we were obviously talking about the final project. So I had the final project uh, data up. And when I logged out, and now that I've logged in, literally like a month and a half later, here's that same file, right? So it just stays there. So it's kind of nice. Um, I put all of our data files in our um, Google stuff, right? So here's your data sets. And you'll want to read this first because um, it's usually easiest to just download the zip um, file and you'll want to um, unzip it, basically save all the data files someplace on your computer. And then when you go to SAS, you can literally upload all of them at once, right? So you can see if I highlight this folder, this all of a sudden became dark, which is the upload button, right? If you hover over it, it pops up and says upload and you click on that 
And then all you have to do is um, click on choose files and it'll open up a browser window. Then you go to your, you know, where is it on my computer? You find it. And then you can actually highlight multiple Excel files and hit open and it'll open all of them at the same time. It'll, it'll upload all of them at the same time. So you can kind of batch upload everything, which is nice. You don't have to do them one at a time. And that's why I say the, the whole, you know, read me first thing is, where is that? Uh, here, if you read that, it'll, it'll walk you through it. But if you wanted to do them individually, you could click on it and go, okay, well, these are all the data files we need for week two. And you'll notice that there is no week one because the week one homework doesn't use any data. You're not gonna be doing any SAS at all in week one. So you can use this whole week to just make sure that you get enrolled in SAS and get it up and running. The homework is not going to um, use SAS or any statistical analysis whatsoever. The first set of homework is all vocabulary stuff. How much difference is there between SAS and StatCrunch? Well, SAS is um, the difference between SAS and StatCrunch is the difference between um, a Camaro and a Lamborghini. If you know anything about muscle cars, right? So they both get the job done. They're both very fast. They're both considered sexy by many, but one is just a little nicer than the other, and that's SAS, right? SAS has far more um, power under the hood than StatCrunch, right? SAS is an extremely powerful statistical analysis tool that can do literally the type of statistics that are done by NASA and you know um, the Department of Defense and the most you know, MIT is using SAS. It's that kind of thing. StatCrunch can do everything that you're ever going to need to do in a far simpler way. It's a much more point and click kind of thing. But it's, you know, like I said, it's the difference between, um, let me put you this way. If I was on a dissertation committee, and somebody wanted to use StatCrunch to do their statistics in their PhD dissertation, I'd go, not on my watch. If they wanted to do it for a master's, yeah, I'd probably let it slide. But if you're doing a doctoral level degree, you're supposed to be considered an expert in your field. StatCrunch is a little too, what's the word? I don't know. Uh, elementary, maybe, for a doctoral level student. It would be something that I would encourage my um, bachelor students to use, for sure, because it's a great tool. Um, and if you wanted to, and I use it all the time just to run quick statistical analyses on things, but if I was going to publish my results, I sure as hell wouldn't do it in StatCrunch, because I would get laughed out of the, you know, educational community or wherever I was trying to publish my results because it's just not considered elite enough. And I know that sucks, but it, there still is that kind of thinking in education. So um, it's much easier to use. It's a point and click kind of thing. Um, but then again, SAS on demand has become very point and click as well. You know, when you go to StatCrunch, Everything is literally menu driven, right? So if I want to do some summary statistics, I go stat, summary stats on the columns. And then I, you know, obviously I would choose nothing's here because I don't have any data. And if it was, I could double click on it. And it's, I put column one over here and then I can come down here and I can choose all the different types of analyses that I want to do and then just hit compute and it spits out the results. It's a very easy to, to do uh, kind of thing. So it's a great, it's a great tool. Um, but I just don't think it's um, rigorous enough. That's the word I was looking for. It's not rigorous enough for doctoral level work. Does that answer your question, Bruce? Yeah, Jeff. Very good. Uh, very good overview and summary. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Anytime. Okay. The uh, only reason why I raised that question is because you said it was awesome. It is in, in, in one of your and uh, I, I thought, well, if it's that awesome, let's check it out. No, it's and, great. Uh, it's it's I think it's an awesome program. Um, uh, 
and it's 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 a very easy to use program. I love it because it it opens up the world of statistics to so many people who normally wouldn't be able to because it makes it so much easier to do statistics. Um, I just think it's too basic for for us. Now that being said, you can absolutely um, always run your stuff in StatCrunch to make sure that you're getting the same results that you're getting out of SAS. Um, and I highly recommend that kind of mentality. You know, if you if you're at all leery about what you're doing in SAS, double check your work with a different technology that you are comfortable with, and make sure that you're getting the same results. Because SAS on demand is actually pretty easy, right? You just click on tasks and utilities, right? You click on tasks. And then let's say we want to do some basic summary statistics. Well, there it is right there, summary statistics. Double click on that and we can run summary statistics. Now you'll notice that it's got a problem here because I don't have any data. So the first thing I have to do is I have to load some data. So I go back here and I'll say, okay, let's, let's work on the data from 310. So I double click on 310 and it puts it over here. That data is still not ready for us. We always have to click the little running man to run it. And now the data has been loaded and you'll see that the data has been loaded into the import work area. I always like to click on output data because this actually shows you what your data looks like. So if, like, if you opened up the Excel spreadsheet, this is what you would see. So now if we go to summary statistics and we click on here, which is the little button that says, hey, let's select a table, i.e. table is their fancy word of a worksheet full of data, right? So if you think about a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, they call those tables. If you click on here, you'll see that under the work and then under import, because that's where we just put our 310, if we say, okay, it's now gonna look at that da data um, as what we're gonna work on. And so now if we come down here and we want, why is it still doing that? It's in import, place it, try it again. Let's just open this again. It doesn't seem to be doing it. Let's try this again. There we go. There we go. Now the stupid thing is working. And then if we go to our analysis and click on plus, it'll show us all the different variables that are in that variable set. So we can try, okay, let's let's run it on all three um, years. And then we can go to options. Right, and okay, um, you know what? I don't care about minimum, I don't care about maximum, but I do want the median. Um, there's some more stuff down here. Um, how about uh, range? Um, well, let's do percentiles. Let's come down here and let's do the lower quartile and the upper quartile, right? All this different fun things I can do. Let's click on, oh, I can do a histogram. How fun. Um, and I can add the normal density curve, right? There's all these different things I can do, uh, play with the output, that's the much I can do there, information that doesn't help me. Okay, so I've, I've played around with this as much, let's just run it and see what happens, right? Because it's not gonna break anything. Click the little running man, and then it thinks about it for a second, and then bam, here it is, right? So here are my three variables that I ran it on. Here's the mean standard deviation, right? Here's all the statistics for each of those variables in a nice little table. And then it gives me each little display. So here's 1985, and you can see, let me make this so you can see it a little better. Obviously my data doesn't have a, a real good normal distribution. Um, I look at this one, uh, that's also looking a little skewed. And so is that one, right? So that's everything that I got pretty quick and easy out of SAS. So it's pretty easy to use, right? It's a, it's it's not as scary as it sounds. And if you use this SAS how-to guide, which is in our Google folder, I literally walk you through how to do everything you need to do in SAS, and I've broken it down by the week, right? So in week two all the things that you need to run. So if there's a question that says, hey, do frequencies, this is how you do frequencies. Hey, do summary stats, this is how you do summary stats, right? And then here's some code to do some things that SAS doesn't do automatically. And of course, I'll talk about this more next week and so on and so forth. Okay, we need to do some graphs. Here's histograms and how to play around with them. And, and then we get into work, work week three, quantile plots and blah, 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 right? So everything is laid out very easily in here and then as you've heard from your classmates, the workshops help as well. Okay, so questions on what you need to do this week. Really, all you have to do is um, get enrolled in SAS if you want to use SAS, and I strongly, strongly uh, recommend that you do. And then uh, get the homework going. 
Um, our next meeting, let's plan on meeting Thursday. I'm still waiting to see what's coming from the Doodle poll. Let me refresh and see if anybody else has filled it out since I last checked. Last time I checked, it was 19 out of 27. Drum roll, please, still 19. You can see that um, Thursday at seven has 11 people. Wednesday at eight has 12. I would say with only a one person difference, I would still go for Thursday at seven because it gives you that extra day. This week, of course, we will definitely do Thursday because we're, you know, we're, we're late as it is and it doesn't make sense to meet today and then meet again tomorrow. Um, so we, uh, let's plan on meeting this week, Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time for you to be able to ask questions, right? That'll be our Q&A session. And then unless the last eight people all come through and choose, you know, Wednesday and not Thursday, we'll probably do, uh, it looks like Mondays at seven and Thursdays at seven will be the set times for our weekly meet sessions. Uh, but I'll, I'll keep you posted as this comes through. For this week, we will do Thursday at seven and I have already um, created that Zoom meeting for this week. Oh, I need to leave student view. You'll see Thursday. It says 4 p.m. because it's my time, Pacific time. It's 7 p.m. Eastern. So that's going to be our Thursday meeting this week, and I'll send an email out to let everybody know about that as well. And then <clears throat> starting next week, I'm assuming we're going to most likely be on Mondays at 7 and Thursdays at 7. Um, and we'll just do that for the you know weeks 2 through 5. Okay, so for this week, just make sure you get going on the homework so you can ask all the questions that you need to ask on Thursday. Um, and then if you want to turn in your homework early for my feedback, just be sure and follow the rules, please, and turn them in in the right way. Um, and then it must be done by Thursday at midnight. Okay, questions? Dr. McBride, um, are there going to sometimes be weeks where we want to take advantage of the Thursday um, and then other weeks where we may just forego that and, and do Sunday? Yeah, I mean, it's it, all of my meetings are voluntary. You don't have to come to any of them. Oh, no, I mean the um, the opportunity to turn the homework in early to get your feedback. Oh, yeah, you don't have to turn stuff in early. Absolutely. Um, um, and some weeks you'll want to and some weeks you won't. And then some weeks, you know, you just won't be able to because you'll be too damn busy. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the pre-look um as as lonnie put it which i kind of like that um that phrasing um is 100 voluntary um it's just my offer to you so that i can act more as a mentor and less as a grader right i hate being just the evaluator that takes points off i'd rather be the person that helps you fix those mistakes before you get graded so that's what the pre-look is for makes sense thanks absolutely Anything else? I just have a question. How many how many folks are are feeling good about turning the machine on, turning the the SAS machine on, and without even uh, without looking at a lot of videos and reading through the how to guide um, at this I, point? At I this would point. say very few. I mean, without without looking at some of my videos and walking through the guide, I think most people are, are feeling a little um, apprehensive about SAS. But I think once you walk through this, you'll see that getting enrolled is a pretty easy process. Um, and then once we start actually diving into it and doing some stats, some SAS work, and I can show you how to do more of this like I just did tonight, you'll see just how easy it really is. All right, uh, that was good. That, that Dr. Was McBride, good. Um, Dr. McBride, so do you still want a screenshot um, no. that we got into it and that we uploaded files? No, not at all. Okay. I just wanted to um, say that I tried it on my own and I, <laughs> I tried to get it. I don't need to, I don't need to read anything. And I did it and I spent so long just trying to figure it out, which I got pretty far. But then I read, 
did your how to and it's like oh wow why did i waste that time on my own so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it, it was cool it is cool yes yeah, so yeah thank yeah you. it's pretty easy and, <laughs> and i encourage you guys to play around with it i have had some students in the past and by all means we are beyond you know we're we're, we're beyond eight o'clock so anybody who has to go and this, this this is always the case if you ever have to go early just go you know, this is all voluntary. So whether you show up, don't show up, show up late, leave early, totally fine. You don't need to explain yourself. We're all adults. We have things that we have to do. Uh, you're not going to offend me if you show up late or, or leave early. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we've we've talked about everything we need to talk about today. So if you want to go, um, go. But um, I'll, I'll share some funny stories with you. I, I a couple of classes ago, um, I had a student who was thoroughly scared to death of statistics and especially of SAS. And after going to um, one of those help sessions workshops and watching a couple of my videos, she took to it like a duck to water. And in fact, um, a lot of this code, in fact, I can show you this code right here is hers. She came up with some of this code. She came back and said, you know, I figured out, I think, uh, no, this is it this is hers she found out a really cool way of um making our histogram look even better and she she did it all by just playing around and and google searching and things like that so um just come at it with an open mind and jump in with both feet and and i'll be there to to catch you when you fall so to speak all right thanks for showing up everybody um and i will see you hopefully thursday thanks a lot dr m appreciate my, you. my pleasure Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.